We are still being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Researchers are continuing their search for a vaccine. In the meantime, there are treatments being used on those infected and continued hopes that our own immune systems can do the job to fight off the novel coronavirus. Dr. Francisco Delgado is a chair for a very special stewardship committee at one of the major hospitals in Indianapolis, Indiana, and that's where he teaches about internal medicine. Dr. Delgado, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you for the invitation to be with you. Oh, not a problem. Now, when you first heard of COVID-19, what were your thoughts and what did you think about the symptoms and the virus as a whole? We had a little bit of uh, background from the first coronavirus that was called SARS, S-A-R-S, number one, which I think you were closer to uh, because you had some cases up all the way to Toronto. So we knew a little bit what to expect. We just uh, didn't have a lot of information in the very beginning to know how how much to you know how much of a problem this was going to be, and it turns out it was a lot more uh, problematic than we were expecting. Yes, has the virus mutated in any way as it's gone from person to person? The, the viruses change their genetic material. So when you talk about mutations, there are always mutations within viruses. Those mutations are usually very small. Uh, really, at, at this point, uh, not, not clinically significant, meaning that those mutations do not... Uh, we cannot talk about different viruses, per se. There's just small changes in the genetic material of the, of the virus. So in a way, yes, it is mutating, but it, the, the mutations are not significant at this point. Is there one vaccine that can really wipe out the entire virus? We hope so, but it's not here yet. Now, what's currently happening in the pursuit to create a vaccine for COVID-19? Uh, well, what's happening, there's a, there's a lot of vaccines that are, trying, uh, you know, that are being uh, evaluated. Uh, last I heard, there's about 44 or something different candidates. Uh, only a few of them have reached what we call clinical studies. Uh, that means being given to people to see if it works. Uh, and uh, they are, you know, we still are trying to figure out if those vaccines are safe and uh, if, if they can be produced in enough quantities to reach essentially all of the world. So, Dr. Delgado, what treatments are they currently using on patients that have extreme COVID-19 cases? Uh, so, the severe coronavirus cases are the ones that essentially land in the hospital that require significant amounts of oxygen for people to survive. And unfortunately, we don't have that many treatments. So far, we know that uh, steroids can help some people uh, there has been an antiviral that was given what we call an emergency use authorization. Uh, the latest articles that are coming out are not um, very uh, optimistic uh, because they don't seem to have the benefit that we were hoping that, uh, uh, that they had. So we really are very limited on the treatments that we have for coronavirus at this point in time. That's why we are trying to look for other alternatives that we that could help us uh, treat the virus uh, in a more effective way. Now, in a recent article, you stated that researchers are making progress by mimicking the immune system's operation, highlighting the elegant and sophisticated design of the immune system. Can you explain? Sure. The way that the vi that, that the body uh, attacks virus or controls viruses is uh, this way. The, bo the body will produce something, co something called antibodies, which are proteins. And these proteins will bind to the virus and essentially render it inactive. Uh, that is the way that the, that, uh, that the body essentially protects us against viruses. One of the principles which behind using what we call convalescent plasma, which is a, another possible treatment modality, is essentially that we collect the antibodies from a person who has recovered from the coronavirus. Uh, we isolate 
the portion of the blood that has those antibodies and then we transfuse it to patients that are infected with the virus, hoping that there are enough antibodies that will bind the virus and render it inactive. Unfortunately, we, uh, we haven't seen a lot of uh, good data also from this kind of approach. So one of the things that we are trying to do is to see if companies that have isolated those antibodies, which are called neutralizing antibodies, if we are able to find the right antibody and give it to a person that is sick, then those antibodies will bind to the virus and essentially render it inactive. Can you offer up a better understanding of how bodies are designed to literally combat viruses using something called sentinel cells? Yes, that, the immune system, I gotta tell you, it is extremely complicated. And uh, the way that essentially this happens is once you are exposed to, let's say, a virus, a bacteria, there are cells that will recognize that something is not supposed to be there. Those cells will essentially attack that pathogen. They will break it down into multiple small pieces. They will essentially sort out which pieces of that pathogen can be useful or, they, or can be the Achilles heel of that pathogen. And then they present those portions, those uh, pieces of, of the pathogen to other cells and tell them, listen, this is what you're going to be looking for, so mount a response against this kind of a, of a pathogen, against this kind of structure, if you see it around the body. So, Dr. Delgado, as much as we know about other viruses, what's the unique challenge when it comes to COVID-19 specifically? What sets it apart? Yes, the challenge is, first of all, a time-wise challenge. The more we... Uh, go through this pandemic, there is going to be a lot more deaths, number one. Uh, we will find some alternatives to, to combat this virus in the future, but this is, this is really more of a time, uh, a, a race against time. If you take, for example, another virus like the HIV virus, right now we have been able to uh, produce a lot of medications that control the virus very well, but it has taken us more than 30 years to get to this point. Uh, of course, the death toll from HIV is very high. Uh, so we're facing the same scenario with a virus that is actually killing people in a much faster way than, uh, than HIV. So that's why the challenge is more a race against time at this point. Now, when it comes to the virus, doctor, living on things like a piece of paper or maybe a metal on a door handle on a car, or if you go to a clinic, how long does it actually live in and how does it survive? Yes, it, it depends on the surface that you're talking about. Uh, there are several studies that put out, you know, there's anywhere between one and eight hours, depends on what kind of a surface you are, you are considering. Despite the fact that the virus lives for several hours on surfaces, it doesn't seem to be the main route of transmission. So you could be touching uh, stuff that is contaminated, but unless you put that stuff directly in your nose, in your mouth, in your eyes, then really the chances for you getting infected are going to be rather low. So, I mean, if we're social distancing or physically distancing two meters apart, about six feet, plus having the masks on, chances are we're not going to catch the COVID-19 virus. That is correct. That is correct. Distancing and protection of eyes, mouth, and, and uh, nose is very important to prevent transmission. So, doctor, in your opinion, will the virus ever be completely eradicated, or will we have to learn with it, like you mentioned earlier, like with SARS or maybe with flu, the flu? You know, that's a very good question, and it is very difficult to tell at this point in time. The first SARS, uh, SARS coronavirus 1, for unknown reasons, essentially disappeared from the face of the earth. So we have not been able to, you know, to find that same virus right now. Will that happen with this coronavirus? You know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't sound plausible because we, you know, it's already all over the place. It's a, this is a, a possibility is that this virus will be 
living on, in a, in a uh, small percentage of the population in areas of the world, you know, throughout history, really. We don't know yet, but that is, a, that is a very interesting question. We don't have an answer yet. As a medical doctor that has had so much experience working with viruses, what motivated you to conclude your article by saying that our bodies speak loudly about the exquisite design of our immune system and that we are truly, are fearfully and wonderfully made? Monoclonal antibodies, what we're trying to use to fight this virus, is actually mimicking something that the body does, uh, which is essentially manufacturing uh, antibodies that are going to inactivate the virus. The interesting part is that our body takes only days to manufacture these antibodies, whereas it's taken us months to even get something that we can try on people safely. And this effort has involved multiple researchers throughout the world. So multiple minds essentially trying to mimic what the body does. It essentially speaks of a, a, a fascinating amount of design of the immune system. As a Christian working in the field of infectious diseases, how has that really impacted your faith? And how are you able to harmonize your faith with science? Yes. Um, it, 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 this is a, a question that has a lot of aspects to it. Part of the issue with infectious diseases, uh, you could say, is part of the issue on why people get sick and what you know, why is the issue with suffering? How come they're suffering? So we could go on that on that side. But essentially, my role, my calling, has been to help those people that are suffering. I like the idea of infectious diseases and the reason I became an infectious disease specialist is because it has a very tangible impact. We can really cure a lot of diseases with, with our antibiotics and essentially transform people's lives. You know, at one point infectious diseases was the main killer of uh, humans and with all the advances in modern medicine, we've been able to turn that around. Yes, there's still a lot of ground to cover, but uh, it, it really, we really have made a big impact on, 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 on infectious diseases. Dr. Delgado, let me ask you something. Some people are saying all of the wildfires we're experiencing up and down the U.S. West Coast, you know, some of the flooding taking place and different viruses, including the novel coronavirus, are all signs of the end times. What are your thoughts? I probably wouldn't go that far. I think that there are many of these uh, things that we're seeing that have happened throughout time. And uh, again, I would be very difficult to conclude that this is, this, is the end, this is the end of everything. I do not think that we would have the full picture to conclude that. Dr. Francisco Delgado, thanks a lot for your efforts in the medical community. And thanks again for joining me on Bridge City News. Thank you so much for the invitation again.